Hey, everybody. I'm very happy today. We have, we have uh, two fantastic guests that I know that you're going to enjoy. They're twin brothers, and but they have two different names. We're going to find out why that is. One is Keith Hilton, an American law professor and one of the top tort scholars in the world. He is currently the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor at Boston University Law School, a prolific scholar, widely recognized for his work across total spectrum of topics in law economics. Hilton has published five books and more than 100 articles in numerous law and economic journals. And Kevin Nathaniel is a celebrated world music artist who has toured internationally, but was forced into becoming a medical freedom activist in New York City when the COVID crisis shut down the entire entertainment industry. Kevin connected and worked with New York City activists resisting lockdowns and mandates, including New York Freedom Rally, Teachers for Choice, and Children's Health Defense. These two twin brothers took radically different paths in life, but today find themselves converging and, you know, in agreement with many of the things that we've been fighting for in this campaign. And welcome both of you to your to the show. Thank you. Thank Tell you. us first, why, you know, why do you have, why are you twin brothers with two different names? That's up to him to answer. <laughs> Kevin? Right. And that's nearly my fault. I well, but, 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 First of all, where am I talking to you? from Europe. I'm in Japan. Okay. You're in yes. Japan. And uh, Keith, I'm going to say where you are. You're in Boston? I'm in Boston. Okay. Okay. Now, Go ahead and explain. You, you must have changed your name. Yes. And I didn't change it at all. I'm in Japan exactly for the reason, some of the reasons you mentioned, for music. I was just uh, playing in Kyoto last night, got up early this morning. I use Kevin Nathaniel basically as my stage name. So all the music I produce and all the music events I do and performances are under Kevin Nathaniel. I keep the name Kevin Nathaniel Hilton, but I don't use that as my stage name. So I just in general use Kevin Nathaniel. That's why. <laughs> yeah. And are you in Kyoto right now? I'm in Shiga. I was in Kyoto only a couple of hours ago. <laughs> okay. Because I was there, uh, I, I guess it was about six months ago, Cheryl and I. And over to Kyoto, we stayed 10 days there because uh, I got surgery there on my throat, a special surgery that only they invented in Kyoto. That's the only place that they do it. And, and it helped me a lot. I, my voice I probably sounds really bad to you, but it sounded much worse a year ago. So, and both of you, you were the, your dad was deeply involved in the civil rights movement in our country, correct? Yes. That's true. As we know, there's a picture that surfaced of my father with Bobby Kennedy Sr. And it's from a picture from the Jefferson Jackson dinners from 1967 in Detroit, uh, in which Bobby Kennedy came to Detroit. And my father at the time was very active in the Democratic Party. He was vice chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party. And he was doing a lot of work in politics. Of course, he was in constant contact with the heavy hitters in the Democratic Party. Uh, so of course, when Bobby Kennedy was coming through Detroit, he was spending time working with him, talking to him. I imagine going places wherever he was going to help and assist. And he was definitely a strong supporter of Bobby Kennedy and in 67. And I delved into all the reasons why, and believe me, I know why he was a strong supporter of Bobby Kennedy. In 67. Yeah, my dad was first as, as counsel of the Senate, but more importantly, during his, while he was Attorney General of the United States, was leading the Kennedy administration's battle, civil rights battles in Alabama, Mississippi, and other parts of the country, and twice sent federal troops to integrate Old Miss and the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. The first two Black students at the University of Alabama were Vivian Malone Jones and James Hood. And in fact, I was with the other day, I was with the children of some of those students, uh, Malone and some of the other students who were, you know, who integrated at the University of Alabama. And so what, what was your path to where you are today? When you say my path to where I am today, which is sitting here in, <laughs> in Japan, I began going into really great educational environments. My father was very strong and very big on education. So he made 
sure that we were doing very well in school. And my mother too, we, they made sure that we were doing very well in school. I credit them for that. So both Keith and I went to, at what well, at the time, the top schools in the country. Keith, of course, went to Harvard. I went to Yale. Well, so of course I was interested in arts and music. And so I went short, really quickly into music and that kept growing. And when I came out of school, really that's when I found my passion in the world of world music and African music. And I began to build and make instruments and create music and work with some really interesting music groups, music projects, which has led me all over the world, which kind of, you know, is a constant progression to lead me to where I am today. And that's part of my path. And part of it was sort of a, in a way, a rebellion to my father's constant pressure for me to be a lawyer like him, but in a way, a, a sort of a, a desire to find what was in my heart. And that effort to find what was in my heart led me on this path. And Keith, you took a more and conventional path through. You, well, could, you, could say it's, you could say it's more conventional, though I, I remember having a conversation with a colleague, and I think there were, there were other people in conversation. And so I, I mentioned, well, my brother is a musician and an artist. And here I am, I'm studying law and economics, writing in the area. And, so, and one person said, oh, wow, you guys went so to, in such different paths. And another person said, well, no, actually, I think it's the same thing. <laughs> uh, so the, the other person, I guess, had, had, I think, the better answer. Because what, I'm, what I see myself as doing is, although I'm writing stuff about the law, antitrust law, tort law, when I'm working on something, it is not very different from, I hate to say it, an, an art project. I mean, I, I have, a, it's like I have a canvas in front of me and I'm thinking about the different things that I could say. And I'm, I'm concerned about a lot of the same things that an artist would be concerned about in producing an, an art project. So in, in some sense, we haven't done things that are that different. To some extent, we both, I guess, departed from what my father wanted because my father wanted all of, the, all of his sons to come practice law with him in Detroit. Kevin went off to, to music. I got a PhD in economics. On the other hand, I guess I should mention my father departed from what his parents wanted. Exactly. <laughs> his parents wanted him to stay in the church because my, yeah. my father grew up in the church. His father was a pastor. It was, it was church 24 seven in his house. And he went on, went, went on to become a lawyer and, you know, did business deals and, you know, worked, did all sorts of uh, litigation even civil rights litigation, you know, criminal cases, civil cases, you know, many of his family members in Rowan, Virginia were upset with what he did, were, were upset with his decision to leave the church because they thought that was such an important role that their family, that the whole family had been involved in. And they thought it was, uh, it was just uh, it, an extreme departure from what was expected. I want to add, Keith, you're absolutely right. I remember at the funeral, for our grandmother, there were several family members that criticized our father for his choice to go into law and business uh, at the actual funeral. I remember that. So yeah, that's the, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I've, I'm, in fact, I've said that to people too. I said, well, I chose the path of art, but Keith chose the path of going sort of one step further with the whole legal idea, uh, with the whole idea, going into the theoretical realm of it. But I think my father's. What, what, go ahead. I think my father's growing up in the church had a big impact on his approach to the law, how he, how he viewed the law, because you know he grew up in in the black church. His father had worked in the railroads and then became a pastor. This was at a time where his father, my grandfather, uh, had become a pastor. We weren't that far out of slavery days, maybe a generation at most. And so the moral messages that they were dealing with were of a very serious nature. The lessons they had to impart were, were very important. And I guess I have the sense, looking back, that they were that the largely men of the church at that time felt that they were doing something extremely important. I could see how my grandfather would be upset with my dad's decision to leave that. Yeah, well, they also, I mean, he grew up at the height of, of Jim Crow because I was, you know, born in Virginia. Raised there to live there till I was 13 years old. So that would have been 19. So, well, I would know. I, I left Virginia in 68, so the year my dad was killed. I was 14 at that time. 
you know, Virginia. What part of Virginia? When I, I was in McLean, I, you know, McLean at that time was not a suburb. It was rural, kind of horse and cow country. And, you know, we, we were raised on a farm with cows and horses and chickens and everything else. But we, it was also at the height of Jim Crow. And, you know, it was illegal for a black man to marry a white woman or, or vice versa in, in Virginia. The public parks were segregated. Our, our schools were segregated. The prisons, mental institutions were all segregated. Drinking water fountains were segregated. It was illegal for, and of course, public transportation, public restrooms were all segregated. I, you know, I've, I've told this story before that I had a, there was a black man who worked for my family who had served in World War II during in the Seabees. The, the blacks weren't actually allowed to fight till the end of the war when Truman came in. But there is a lot of them serving in the military and other roles, including the construction brigades, the CBs, and he served in the Pacific, which was hazardous duty, building airstrips on the, you know, as they jumped across through, through the Japanese islands toward the main island of Japan. He's about six foot five, incredibly brilliant man, dignified. And, but when I, I started hunting and fishing when I was very, very young, and he'd drive me across the state, and I would have to go into the restaurants and diners, buy the food for both of us. We would eat it in the car. He asked me one day to buy shoes for him because he wasn't allowed to into the shoe store. So I went in and picked up the shoes. Then he tried them on the curb on the sidewalk. And if they didn't fit him, that was too bad. But anyway, that you know, the, your dad grew up in Virginia at that same time or lived during that same time. And I'm sure that that was, you know, one of the central gravities of his life that, you know, the oh, for sure. system. Yeah, for sure. In fact, he, you, I'll, I'll let you go, Ken. Okay. Yeah, I want to support that too. What you're saying is that, oh, yeah, just to tell you one of the stories my father told me about when he had first day in college, he met my mother at Talladega College. The first day they landed in college, the Ku Klux Klan, now, Talladega College was a black college, it still is a black college at the time, a black who wanted to go to college would go to Talladega. That was one of the black colleges. Because yes. of course they, they weren't, yeah, they weren't being allowed in other, other colleges largely. Uh, but the first day they got on campus, the Ku Klux Klan rode through the campus to basically scare and frighten all the college students. That was the first day. And I want to mention too, that when shortly after he got out of college, he told me a story about him going out with my uncle, whose name was Pop Foster, and they had had some drinks and they sat on a stoop. This was somewhere in Alabama or Georgia. And they sat on a stoop and were talking and it was in, at night and they saw a cop car pull up and they saw the cops get out of the car and they looked at each other and literally said goodbye to each other because it was commonly known that if you were black caught out at night and if you were sitting by yourself in some southern towns that if the cops pulled up on you at night you might not be going home it was a very serious time that he grew up in in that way i want to take that and thread that to a story that that i heard you know about your father and your uncle going to get martin luther king out of jail in i believe 60 was before your uncle uh, was elected president and that Martin Luther King had been arrested and given a very stiff sentence, a stiff prison sentence. And your father and your uncle literally ran to get Martin Luther King out of jail. And really the, for someone to hear that and read it in Google, you don't really realize the, the environment that was happening. You don't realize the gravity of what happens when Martin Luther King was given a stiff prison, prison sentence at that time uh, in the South the gravity of it is he might not be coming out of that sentence. So, and I believe that's why your father and your uncle ran to get him out. This is before many of the, you know, the, much of the work that Martin Luther King was able to really do after that time. He did a lot of it while your uncle was president, but they ran to get him out uh, when he was given that really harsh six month sentence, which Probably would have meant chain gang. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, one, I just wanted. Let me, yes. 
let me give you an addendum to that story. Okay. My father grew up in Boston and, and then in Brookline, and it just didn't have any contact with Black people. I had no sort of knowledge of the civil rights movement, but he had a couple of things happen. He, when he played football at Harvard, there was a Black member of the team, and when they toured in some of the Southern states, he was not allowed to stay at the same hotel, and my father at that time protested that and made it so that they would all go to hotels that they all could stay in. And then when my father was at University of Virginia, he invited Ralph Bunch, who had, you know, was a secretary of the United Nations and was famous for international leader who had been flirted with the Communist Party. He invited him to speak at the University of Virginia. And at that time, it was illegal to have integrated crowds in Virginia. And Ralph Bunch, when he got there, he stayed with my father in his house. The Klan protested outside and burned a cross outside their house. And my father, my, my father and mother had just got married. And this is the first that they'd seen of that. But my father was indignant about it. University of Virginia originally said, you know, we can't do it. It's illegal against the law. He, he wrote a brief and he organized a student petition and they ended up getting it so the bunch, it was the first integrated group in the University of Virginia, but still, when he was running, it was not an issue that was prominent on his mind. He was concerned with the mafia and a bunch of other issues that he'd been with. And then Coretta King called and said, Martin is in prison in Alabama. If they put him in jail, they pulled him over for a traffic offense. I think it was like a taillight out. And they, like you said, I think they gave him a six month sentence. And Coretta was scared that it being Alabama, he might not come out of the prison alive, out of the jail alive. And she asked my uncle to intervene My and ended up with my father, who was running his campaign, his campaign manager. And my father at first said, the first voice in him was the political voice that said, it's better not to get involved with this issue because we'll lose the solid Democratic vote in the South. It was all white at that time. You know, Blacks at that time were voting Republican. They were still the party of Lincoln. He got the message when he was at Hickory Hill, which was about 10 minutes from National Airport, which is now Reagan Airport. And he got in the car and he started driving to airport and he, he started uh, thinking about it. And it was, it started irritating him. The, just the part of it that was the bullying part, because he hated bullies. And when he got to the airport, he had flipped. And he went to the payphone and put a bunch of times in and he got the White House where he got the Senate, you know, the Senate switchboard to get that 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 sheriff on the phone. And then he read that sheriff, the riot act, saying, you know, my brother's going to be president and uh, you better make sure that nothing happens to Dr. King. And they ended up releasing him. And the public didn't find out about it, but but Coretta knew about it. And Daddy King, who was Martin's father, who was very who was a preacher himself, very influential in the Black movement. And it's one of the reasons that my uncle won the Black vote, which put him over the edge in 1960. Yeah. He, he, he had the, the lowest margin, the, the slimmest margin he won of any president in history. And it was the Black votes in the South that put him over. I was going to just add as a footnote, about my father's experience, because it's connected to all these things that he, you know, he grew up in Virginia, Roanoke, Virginia. He couldn't, could not go to UVA at his time, at the time, because UVA was a white institution. So he got into Boston University. That's where he went to law school. And so he had the experience of living in Boston and going to BU and then going home to Virginia to segregated train stations, segregated drinking fountains, all the things that, you know, you're talking about. That was in his during his law school time. Yeah. So then he moved to Michigan. That's right. Well, he went, there was an army. He went to the army for a few years in Clean, Texas. You know, they're married. Our oldest brother, our older brother was, was born in Clean, Texas. Then they decided to move to Detroit, Michigan. Uh, yeah. And actually, there's a big difference between moving to Michigan and moving to Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Even though Detroit well, is in Michigan. At that time, Detroit was a boom town. It was, you know. It was, certainly, yeah, it was in good shape. De Detroit, yeah. was a, Detroit was a boom town, but Detroit in many ways was, and I use this word clearly knowing that it's a delicate word to use, but in many ways it was a mecca for Black people all throughout the United States. Uh, I mean, that's where Mo Motown Records was there. 
Yes, and it was also a place in which the Klan was not in full swing. The Klan was not working in Detroit. And uh, even on my mother's side, uh, there were relatives, my mother's uncle, that left the South to come to Detroit because they were threatened by the Klan. Exactly, exactly. So the, the uncle, and you're talking about J.S. right now. Yes, yeah. He brought a lawsuit to uh, enjoin the, I think, attorney general of Georgia from barring teachers who were part of members of the NAACP from working as teachers. He, he, was, he was successful. He joined the attorney general of Georgia, and he immediately got phone calls from the Klan saying, you have 24 hours to get out of here. And that's what sent him to Detroit. Wow. And what happened to you during COVID, Keith? Because your brother ended up becoming an activist. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I just did my thing, just complied with all of the requirements. I got vaccinated. I came to the office when I could. I wore the mask at times. And so anyway, that's, I, that's how I muddled through that whole COVID. And did you guys talk to each other about Oh, yes, yes. We were in touch a lot. Yes, we talked all the time, you know. In fact, I, the funny thing about it, a, lot of fam- a lot of families got divided, yeah. you know. I, 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 I joke about this all the time, but so Kevin and I were in touch with each other a lot. And I remember Kevin telling me very early during the COVID lockdown period, very early, all of the stuff about this is a lab leak out of a, you know, a lab in China. That's what it looks like. And at that time, I was thinking, oh, you know, this sounds r- ridiculous. That just can't be true. <laughs> this was early. So then, what do you know? Years later, I find out that it seems to be exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. You guys ever look at each other and say, I, I wish I had that haircut? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes right. I wish I had a, a, a little laugh. You di- you're the two most different identical twins I've ever seen in my life. You know, and we're actually very good Kevin friends. Kevin has uh, has dreadlocks and glasses and kind of a I don't know what I don't know, like a Doc Holiday uh, <laughs> facial regalia. And, uh, <laughs> And Keith has a very conventional haircut. They're both good looking guys, but I've never seen two identical. I would never place you guys identical twins. <laughs> That's true. I don't think anyone would now. No. Well, no, we 20 years ago. Like when we were little kids. Yeah. 20 uh, years ago, we were identical. Yeah. I, um, me, but I, you know, I, there was. Oh, go ahead. What yeah. were you going to say? Yeah. I, what I just wanted to say was that. The connection is very clear to me, actually your work too, because I feel like your father was so strongly connected to the civil rights movement that actually the civil rights movement and a lot of this actually flowed into a lot of exploitation and oppression flows into what is we call corporate capture. Yeah. And so really, I feel like you are a direct progression of your father's work. That some people, I don't know if they see that that way, but I see your work as a direct progression. Yeah, I would say so too, frankly. Yeah, yeah. I would say too. I would say so. And my reason for saying so is that your father was a dissenter on the Vietnam War at a time when that kind of dissent was difficult to do. And I think it was blasphemous too. You know, what I, what I would want to spend my time on is making sure that, that we start uh, rebuilding equity in black communities, which have been systematically stripped out of uh, African American communities during the 2000s, for by many, many by redlining, by you know just the systematic structural racism against uh, black businesses. You know, Black Wall Street is one example. It's systematically closed, but the redlining, the 2008 mortgage crisis, which, you know, those exotic instruments were tried out first in the Black communities and, you know, the Black communities that did have a lot of equity in their homes in Harlem and uh, Bed-Stuy and around the country lost that equity at that time. And then Detroit, uh, too. And then COVID, 41% of Black-owned businesses will never reopen. And a lot of them had three generations of equity in them. If you don't own a home, if you, you've got a whole community that doesn't have a high home ownership, they have, they have no access to capital. A lot of small businesses will mortgage their home and get enough money to start a business. But if you don't have access to capital, you can't start a business. Yeah. And, that, and the whole, you know, later in my father's life, a lot of his activity 
was in the banking industry and basically small business banking, you know, that's a major issue there because the way banking regulation has worked, it's sort of choked off or choked out a lot of the small businesses, small banks that might have dealt with black owned businesses in the cities. You know, that avenue of economic growth has sort of been made much more difficult to work nowadays. And so that would be an ideal area for change, for trying to change the banking regulations so that small community banks with a focus on development and black neighborhoods, black urban neighborhoods could actually thrive because they have the information on who the people are who are starting businesses, what kind of risks are involved in lending to them. And that information isn't there, isn't locked up in the big banks at all. The big banks, they have all their algorithms and they don't have that kind of information. So that would be a major way in which, you know, we could change things which would go in the direction of, you know, redeveloping, re- redeveloping cities, redeveloping urban black areas in the cities as well. No, I agree that that and education are the two things we just need to flood right now with, with effort, with money, with innovation to try to figure out how to, because what I say to people is, you're never going to get rid of the the efforts to get rid of, you know, racism is kind of ingrained in human behavior. We're we're tribalism of all kinds. We're always looking for differences in each other. And it's always going to be part of human society. So what you want to do is equip people and make them strong and confident. Young black men and women should have the strength and confidence and know that they're going to run into these kind of impediments in their lives, but that they have opportunity, that they have that they have wealth and equity that they can, that's a base that provides them a strong base so they can go forth in the world and encounter all of these difficulties and the biases or whatever, whatever impediments that all of us have as human beings and overcome them. But if you don't have a good education to start with, you're not going to be able to do that. And if you don't have, you know, if you don't have that access to capital, you can't do it. And, you know, the way that the Fed operates with quantitative easing that floods the economy with money and then strips it out and it encourages people to borrow and to put their assets on the line and then makes money hard makes money more expensive and then everybody goes bankrupt and they and the big industry comes in or the big black rock state street vanguard come in and a strip mine all the equity about these communities and black neighborhoods have been targeted more than that and i saw a specific example recently i went to lee harvard which is the is a black community in cleveland and it used to be a booming community all the the businesses are now boarded up. It's like the apocalypse there. And there's two or three businesses that survived COVID. We met with the business owners. They're all now going bankrupt because they cannot get access to capital from the little banks because the little banks, which are the only ones that will loan to Black people, they now, because the price of money is so high, in other words, the interest rates are up at 7%. So their treasury bills, which are their reserves, are now have been severely diminished in value and the rule, the banking rules don't allow them to lend or make it very hazardous for them to lend when their reserves are low. So they're now hoarding their liquidity. And, you know, this one woman who survived, she has an 80 year old sausage business that is provides employment and, you know, and pride for this community. She needs some capital to change some of the machinery that she was using and she cannot get access to capital. So she's closing the business. And all of them had stories like that, that we just can't, you know, we have a thriving business, but we cannot, as Black Americans, cannot get access to capital because the big banks won't loan it to us because they don't care about small business and they don't want to loan in our neighborhood. And the little banks that were the only ones that would make capital available, you know, now are being destroyed through through the high interest rates. Through high interest rates or through regulations that they really can't manage to deal with, you know. Um, I mean, what do you think the path forward is? You know, the priorities should well, be. Do you want to you want to take that, or you want me to start, Kevin? Oh, you start because you're. Oh, yeah. Okay, so for the priorities, well, what issue would you want to start with? With priorities, well, that's that. I mean, you know, what if you were president? What would you do to reinvigorate black communities around this country? Well, first you mentioned education, which I I agree with you completely. And I'd, I'd be open to all sorts of suggestions. I happen to be a big fan of school choice. I have to say that I, people ought to have the freedom, ought to have the same freedoms that uh, that wealthy people have to go to whatever school they want to. 
fact, there's a very interesting video where Milton Friedman is making that pitch to an audience in Harlem. And it's it's kind of amazing how that whole event goes down. I think that's sort of a start, a base, a sort of starting point. School choice strikes me as a, as a very important factor in there, both to give people options, both and also to put pressure on the public schools to improve because they, you know, they should improve if they see there's a, they are at risk of losing funding through students choosing other places. And also, I think there's a matter of freedom. You know, I think there are all these complaints about what's being taught in the schools nowadays. And, you know, as long as you have certain things that you expect of students that, you know, you can implement it through exams, then people, the students ought to be free to sort of learn the things that they think they want to learn, their parents want them to learn, subject to the requirement that they meet competency exams in certain areas, English, math, et cetera. But you know, if you, if, subject to that requirement, if you want to study, if you want to go to a school that emphasizes a particular thing, you want to go to a school that emphasizes religion, you know, if you want to do that, then we ought to o- allow these things. But the big objection is that, that you're going to be robbing the public schools that, you know, badly need this money, that you're going to be robbing them of their revenues. Right. And so, you know, by that argument, the public schools could become infinitely bad and students would have to stay in there. We're not running the system to make sure the schools keep captive students. We're running the system to make sure that students are educated. And to me, if the school choice plan helps in that regard, which I think it would, then that's the argument for it. And hopefully, instead of causing the schools to disappear, it would cause the public schools to improve. Well, there is an argument that would say that public schools have shown a trend of becoming worse and worse over the past, say, couple decades. And I think that anything that would put pressure on them to actually try to improve the situation and make it more of an educational environment. Because right now, I've been into some of these public schools and I've seen some very kind of horrific situations. So yeah, I have to agree with you on that. The institution of of examinations, I mean, so that was one of the innovations here in Massachusetts with the MCAS exam, but it's been in other states too. New York's had its, New York has had its regents exams for some time, you know, and some people don't, don't like examinations. On the other hand, they're a good check on making sure the schools are doing their jobs. And, and I don't see any other way around that other than to have students. You want the examinations to be, you know, rigorous enough that they would force the schools to educate the students. And what was your reaction to the Harvard case, the, you know, the affirmative action case? Well, I I disagreed with the majority because, and I maybe I'll just admit, I, um, I'm a good friend of David Evans, who uh, was running, you could say he was running affirmative action at Harvard for 50 years. He just, just resigned a few years ago. And he's a very thoughtful person. It's, cl- you know, there, there were so many falsehoods about how affirmative action was being implemented by Harvard that were adopted wholesale in Justice Roberts' opinion. So that struck me, that, that gives just a, a base of sort of falseness to the opinion to begin with. And so they were trying to, to do something that it was addressing and solving a social problem in a, a sort of an intelligent way. Evans was working with a lot of people. Most of the decisions were entirely sensible. And I think the district court found that in, in the Harvard case. The district court got to look closely at what people were doing was con- and persuaded. And so I, I, I disagree with what, the, with what the court did. I mean, I think actually I've written, I keep saying I wrote, a, I wrote a paper on that one too. I wouldn't side completely with the arguments of the dissent. I think the dissent in, uh, in that case m- makes some arguments that I, I wouldn't side with. On the other hand, the, the majority's arguments, you know, I certainly disagree with. And I think there is a, a, a very uh, sensible, I would say even conservative argument for affirmative action. In fact, I, but when you say the term affirmative action, it's such a loaded term that it's sort of people have different interpretations of it. You know, people run in completely different directions once you say the term. But let, let's just say, you know, taking race into account in the admissions process, I think, I think there, there are some very conservative arguments for, for doing so. Let's hear, let's hear that argument. Well, OK, let's take let's take the case that everyone seems to agree with. So many of the people who oppose affirmative action have said things like, oh, we'll take the case of a kid from Appalachia whose parents are in bad shape and somehow he pulls himself. A white white kid from Appalachia. A white kid from Appalachia. 
right. who pulls himself up by his bootstraps and gets himself into position where he can get into Harvard or look like he can compete in Harvard. And Harvard takes him, which, of course, happens all the time. And then the argument is, but race. But no, race is a different thing. You know, race should be irrelevant. It shouldn't be part of it. And I think all of the people, the people who are in favor of using race into account are simply saying, look, race is an important statistic in making an inference about the difficulties that someone has overcome to get to that stage. It's often a very powerful statistic. It's often pretty darn good in helping you figure that out. Uh, and we could talk about different ways. You know, one is race combined with zip code. And you know as well as I that there, there are plenty of zip codes where students are going to come at it out with a big disadvantage or being labor or have to labor under a big disadvantage to get in, get themselves at a level where they're getting into the Ivy League schools. But then I guess the position of a Justice Roberts would be, okay, fine, that's just the zip code. But if someone grows up in the suburbs, uh, it's a black kid who grows up in the lily white suburbs. Why would you get? Why would you take race into account in that case? And here I would say, sure, there is a weaker argument for taking race into account. But even then, a lot of the black kids who've grown up in the lily white suburbs <laughs> have dealt with <laughs> obstacles that their white counterparts haven't dealt. I, you know, I can give you an example. So I, I actually have. A, a son at Harvard right now. And he had a 4.0 and his test scores were pretty darn perfect. Pretty darn perfect. I mean, he's had a few of his high school teachers who would say this kid would have gotten into any college he applied to, even if his color were green or blue or whatever. So uh, he's, an, he's a good case to talk about because I don't think there's an argument in his case that he benefited from any kind of you know, relaxed policy or anything. I think he would have gotten in whatever color he was. But he doesn't even know some of the things that happened. You know, I remember there was a teacher in his grade school. I pulled him aside and tried to teach him some extra math one time. He came in and tried to use that that sort of new math in a class. A teacher of his discovered that and just went nuts about it. Just went nuts that his dad would try to teach him teach him some math that wasn't in the curriculum. Now, I don't know if that had anything to do with race, but it certainly made me wonder about it because I did wonder, well, if this had been a white kid and a white father and the teacher discovered that the dad had taught the son some additional math, would she have gone berserk in the way that she did? She went nuts and she threatened to remove him from an advanced math class that he was in which in, in the end she did not do. But I, I'm just offering that as one example of the sorts of things that happen that in many cases are correlated with race. That's why, although the question is how much weight you give to it, it's certainly a relevant statistic in determining what kind of obstacles people have to deal with and overcome. And it's not a solution. What the Supreme Court said in the case, which is, oh, you can talk about it in your essay. It's not a solution because a lot of these kids are young kids who don't even know what sort of obstacles they, they've overcome. You know, they, it's only the obvious cases that, where they would know that. So I, I would say that, you know, again, and I think this is a fairly conservative argument because I'm saying whatever you think is right about the Appalachian case, you can certainly make that argument using race instead of Appalachian because that's just the reality. I think you'd agree yourself that race is still a relevant statistic and in inferring what, whether someone has had to put up with yeah, I, I also, I think one of the most interesting arguments is is about, le is the legacy arguments, which I don't know how much of a yeah. class, I uh, guess, right. because they had a legacy there, meaning they had an ancestor right. there. But, you know, right. the, the legacies, I would say, are probably 99.9% right. 9 white. Right. Well, you have legacies, you have the team, the sports teams that are recruiting and taking a fair amount of students. And those aren't the minority students who are taking, most for the most part, who are taking advantage of that because you have a ton of teams and they're all recruiting their people. So legacies, sports teams, you have all sorts of ways in which sort of special advantages are given to some applicants. And if you, in the end, if you ask, you know, how important is this issue? Well, well it's a tiny problem. I mean, it's a molehill of a problem because there's so few cases, you know, the, 
sort of the vast majority of black students in Harvard today are quite competent and would get in affirmative action or not. And so we're talking about a, a relatively sm a small, surgically applied tool. Well, the Roberts opinion sort of it makes it sound like it was like it was a check the box thing where, you know, if you just check the box and said you're black, you got in, which is just an absolute falsehood. And, all, and the other absolute falsehood that the Roberts opinion relies on is a theory that race is kind of irrelevant in making an inference about the obstacles that someone deals with in today's world. It's it's not irrelevant. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure meeting you guys. And this has been a really, a really, really enjoyable discussion. Thank you so much for sharing your day with me. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and a real honor. And, yes. forward, and by the way, I was very close to Dave Evans as well. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, he was, uh, he's, he's a fantastic, fantastic guy. He is. Well, guys, thank you so much. And I hope you'll come back and join us again. I, I look forward to it. Too. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time.